webinar, Squeezing the Max Out of Oracle 12C Disaster Recovery, brought to you thanks to Exana. My name is Melanie Brady, and on behalf of IOUG headquarters, I would like to thank you all for joining us. Our speakers today are Elaine Azaguri, Vice President of R&D at Exana, and Yossi Nixon, Chief DBA at Exana. Before we begin, I would like to remind the audience to please feel free to submit questions throughout the event via the question chat box on your webinar toolbar. Our speakers will leave some time at the very end of the presentation to address these. And at this time, I would like to welcome today's presenters. Please go ahead, Elaine and Yossi. All right. Thank you, Melanie. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're in the world. Uh, my name is uh, Avana Zaguri, and uh, uh, together with Yossi, we'll be talking about our experience so far with Oracle 12C disaster recovery features. So, moving to the next slide, okay. Um, just a, a quick introduction. Um, as Melanie said, I'm uh, Avana Zaguri, VP R&D at Axana. I joined Exana about uh, not even a year and a half ago uh, from IBM and bringing roughly 30 years of experience in storage, virtualization, cloud systems, uh, and all kinds of uh, systems technology. At IBM, I was also an IBM master inventor. And in my free time, I'm an avid cyclist. Um, Together with me is Yossi. Yossi is a chief database architect. He's been uh, a DBA with 20 years of experience uh, with uh, the areas of infrastructure, architect, uh, disaster recovery strategy development, and monitoring and troubleshooting. You know, he is our go-to person for any questions related to databases. So moving to the next slide, let me share with you the agenda of today's talk. Um, we're going to uh, talk primarily about Data Guard and the disaster recovery en enhancements that we see in Oracle 12C. Uh, we've been working with this technology for uh, uh, the, at least the, the, a year and a half uh, ago, and um, you know we've been gaining a lot of insights uh, that we would like to share with you. Um, after that, so so that's. Primarily, that is, uh, Yossi is going to be uh, taking most of the lead for that, for that discussion. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about you know, what I call the risk distance conundrum, meaning that uh, whenever uh, you, you try to protect yourself, uh, there's a, um, you need to find the right balance between the distance between your primary site and disaster recovery technologies and the the, the risk that you're uh, willing to take. Uh, so we'll be discussing that, and that will give me a segue into the Axana Phoenix technology and how we put it all together. Let's move to the next slide. Um, so let me, uh, for those of you that are not familiar uh, with uh, active data guard parsing, the goal of this uh, slide is just to give you a very, very quick uh, wrap-up of what Farsync is all about. Farsync is basically a lightweight Oracle instance uh, that has uh, all the standard, uh, standby uh, control files, uh, redo logs, archive redo logs, etc., but does not have the data files. Farsync is a new technology that was introduced in Oracle 12C. What the Farsync node does, it's, uh, you put uh, the Farsync node, as we'll show uh, pictorially in a, in a couple of minutes, you put your Farsync node between your primary database and your standby, uh, standby database. And the Farsync node will receive all the redo logs synchronously from the primary, and then forward those redo logs asynchronously to the standby. Upon failover, uh, the, the, the standby uh, will uh, obtain whatever committed transactions have made it to the far sync, but have not yet made it to the standby. And thus, it enables you, and here I would like to uh, stress the word enables you, to get to a zero data loss failover. The reason I mentioned uh, it enables you is that, you know, we'll see that, uh, you know, in some scenarios, actually, you might not get there. The major advantages of uh, Farsync are 
the, the, the amount of uh, resources that it requires in the farsing node, which really it's a minimal CPU, and when I say minimal, you'll, you'll see that, you know, that's, it's very, very modest in, in its requirements from a CPU perspective, from a memory perspective, Maybe from an I.O. perspective, we see that, you know, there's still, um, you know, there's still some significant, not, not as much as in a, in a primary or a standard database, but still some significant I.O. activity that is going on. So, you know, this, and the reason is that there's no recovery and no data files uh, that are running in your Farsync instance. So if I move to the next slide, this is basically putting what I just said into a picture. You can see on the left side, you have your primary node, and on the right side, the standby node. Now, this is, you know, prior to 12C, you would be replicating either synchronously with max availability or max uh, performance or, uh, or max protection directly from your primary to the standby uh, system. With Farsing, basically what, we're, uh, what Oracle uh, is suggesting is that we add a third location, which is the Farsing location, to which the primary will replicate synchronously, and then Farsing, the Farsing node will send the data asynchronously to your remote standby. Now notice that there's an additional arrow going directly from the primary uh, to the standby. Now this, uh, that, the, the, that is labeled alternate. This alternate mode is actually a mode that in, uh, during normal operations will not be active. It will only become active if your farsync node fails, because now we've introduced a third piece into the puzzle, which obviously can also fail. And you don't want the whole system to fail if, uh, if your farsing node fails. So Oracle has provided the capability to automatically uh, switch into alternate mode, which will start sending data from your primary to your remote standby. Okay. So this is, you know, really, uh, we believe that this is great technology. Uh, and one of the major advantages that it brings to the table is that it enables to automate much of the processes uh, that happen during disaster recovery. And this is what this slide here uh, is trying to give you some snippets of, um, you, you know, of, uh, uh, technologies uh, that, that you can leverage together with Farsic. The graph on the top shows uh, what I was discussing earlier how quickly the system can move into alternate mode. So if you lose your first, the system can, in a matter of seconds, switch to alternate, uh, with having a minimal hiccup on your uh, primary application. In addition to that, uh, since we, want the, the, we would like to see the disaster recovery process happen automatically, one of the major recommendations is to leverage the observer technology, putting an observer in a, a, a separate node, you know, potentially a separate site. The observer, as its name indicates, will be observing both, you know, the primary site, standby site, and here in the picture it doesn't show the farsing site, but it's also monitoring the farsing site, and it will have all the knowledge and all the logic to, uh, to to move from one state to another. So if the farsing uh, fails, then it will move to alternate. If your primary site fails, it will uh, make the standby site primary. So you can leverage the observ observer technology to really automate your, uh, your whole process. And by automating, you're making it much less error prone. OK. So this is um, basically the introduction, a very, very quick introduction to the Farsing technology. Let's uh, start going to the next slide. We'll start talking about uh, our lab environment and the ex experiments we, we did. Uh, and uh, in a minute, I will be transferring uh, the, the, to, to Yossi to go into the, uh, deeper details. Basically, what do we have in our lab uh, is um, a farsing um, configuration with two primary systems. 
Each of the primary systems, by the way, is going to be running multiple instances, uh, up to 16 instances, eight, uh, 8 instances on each one of the primary systems. Those will be replicating to a parsing node. There will be a single parsing node to support all of that. And the standby configuration is identical to the primary. So, as far as uh, uh, what we're running on the primary and the standby, it's Oracle 7.2. Uh, um, we're running ASM, Active Data Guard, uh, and um, we, you know, one of the strong recommendations is, is that you make sure that you have the latest and greatest patches for FarSync. The, the server environments are uh, two fairly strong uh, Lenovo pizza, bo pizza boxes. You, you see there, uh, they're dual processors, you know, with uh, multiple cores, 32 gigabytes memory each, and uh, their, uh, the primary and the standbys, uh, their, their, their storage is SSD-based. The FarSync configuration, on the other hand, it's much, like I said earlier, it's much more modest from a, a um, resource perspective. We've been actually running both with, a, with an i7, this is basically a laptop processor, as well as a quad Xeon, still, you know, a single processor, not a dual processor like uh, in the primary and the standby nodes, uh, with 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes uh, of memory, we also have SSDs uh, on those systems. The connectivity between the systems is uh, Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet. By the way, it's, uh, all of our experiments so far have been with the systems all co-located in the same lab. So we have the primary, farsing, and standby all co-located. And by doing that, this actually we're uh, neutralizing all the latency issues that you might have in the network. So, in, in many respects, this is, you know, the, the best of uh, possible worlds. And, by the way, you know, later I will try to give you the motivation of why, from Axana's perspective, collocating the primary and the farsing is what makes most sense. So, this is our environment. Uh, at this point, I'll, uh, I'll transfer uh, to Yossi to, uh, to get deeper into the details. Hi, this is Yossi. Uh, as, uh, as Elaine mentioned, uh, we are using one fasting. You can see uh, here in the, in the picture that there is one fasting server that has a lot of uh, instances, 16 instances, uh, from the primary to the, uh, through the fasting, uh, to the standby, it's called a, a fasting hub. We are using one machine for uh, uh, serving other uh, databases from the primary to the standby. Moving to the next slide, we, we will discuss uh, during our benchmarks all the lessons we, we learned uh, about um, the memory uh, consumption uh, network. Uh, the latency, we use the FarSync uh, option also. Uh, how the FarSync server, uh, the CPU, uh, was uh, in this load. And uh, the IO pattern of the, of the FarSync, how, how it uh, behaves. Uh, our benchmark was based on a slow utility, a, a utility that is uh, we use the uh, reduce stress uh, from this with this utility to all of uh, uh, our uh, in, in all of our benchmarks. So memory consumption uh, since uh, fasting is it's a small it doesn't do almost anything just uh, handling uh, the read log uh, transfer from the primary to the standby. So there is no need to allocate more than uh, 300 uh, gigabyte uh, memory SGA. Megabytes. Megabytes, I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, we, we checked uh, even uh, one gigabyte uh, SGA and we, we, we saw no, no differences uh, when we did it. Uh, since uh, the fasting is in a mount stage, uh, so uh, uh, there is no uh, database buffers that uh, it is using, you know, data file handling, no uh, checkpoints uh, in this uh, light uh, instance. Uh, okay, 
the the only memory that we we could uh, thought that we can use because this uh, this machine is not using any memory it has a, a 16 uh, gigabyte uh, memory we can uh, we thought about uh, using a, a storage cache uh, uh, to allocate the storage cache maybe to to make it uh, uh, to use less IO, we will uh, talk about the IO pattern and we see why, why it is uh, one of our concerns. Yeah, uh, basically again, uh, from, so from a memory perspective, just to stress what the Yossi was saying, uh, as you can see, you know, even with 10 instances, which we believe that, you know, most customers will not put as many instances in on, a, on one parsing node, that only would bring it to three gigabytes of SGA, you know, leaving a lot of memory uh, free for other users. Moving to the next slide, we talk about the networking. Uh, we, we, we check the networking from a lot of perspectives because it is important. It is important that uh, the primary will not harm uh, is the performance when uh, it is transferring that are synchronous to, uh, synchronous to, to the fasting. Uh, so we uh, we had a lot of uh, experience uh, using a DNA, or like a DNFS. Uh, we and we succeeded to gain a, a high performance when we use the jumbo frames MTU and nine thousand. Uh, so we decided to implement it in the fasting, and we saw a, a better performance with this uh, setup of uh, the network. Also the network cards, we used the two, uh, two, uh, two ports uh, that was uh, bonded active-active, uh, so we could, uh, we could uh, get a uh, 10 gigabyte uh, ports for, uh, for each connection. The, uh, the, at the primary and also in, in the first thing, we, we use the uh, uh, simultaneous some uh, uh, archive processes to, to transfer the data from the primary to the fasting. Uh, and uh, we use the max connection parameter also to make it to uh, not just one connection. The default, I think, it's, it's, very, it's very low. So we enlarge these numbers to, to make the transfer uh, to, to be uh, faster. We also they, they defined some uh, network parameters on, in the SQLnet.org uh, uh, to, to have the packet size uh, uh, bigger. Yeah, one, one final comment that I would make here is that uh, if you're looking at uh, minimizing the, the network traffic, one option is obviously to, to use compression. We haven't done that yet. Uh, however, you know, it, it, it was clear that for, for us that uh, adding compression will, would uh, take its toll on the CPU cycles. So, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off. Since we did not reach uh, the, the, you know, we were not able to max out the network uh, capabilities of our systems, uh, we decided at this time that we would not use compression, but the option is there. We'll move to the next slide about the fast uh, sync option. Uh, in Oracle 12.1, uh, Oracle introduced the sync no affirm option. Uh, the, 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 it's called fast fast sync. Uh, with uh, fast sync is synchronized, by, but the knowledge of is from the memory, the process memory, uh, before it is written to the disk. So, in this situation, it's kind of a, a risk, and if you will have a disaster uh, or fasting failure, uh, unless the fasting has its own uh, battery backup. Yeah. Well, one comment to make here is, um, uh, as the slide says, we, we, didn't, we did not see a significant performance advantage uh, when using NoAffirm. You know, one, one explanation, and this is, uh, you know, the, the reason it's not written it's, uh, on the slide is that at this point it's just a, a conjecture, is that uh, when you're under heavy load, uh, the, uh, you, you, you will need to destage the data in your, in your buffers. And therefore, you know, probably the NOAA firm will show you much better uh, latency if you're under uh, low, uh, relatively low load. 
where you're not forced to to do, uh, to offload the uh, the data that is in your uh, in your buffers. But you know, since we were trying to push to push as much data as we could to the farthing nodes, probably you know the fact that the, you know the the, the the system needed to uh, to write down the the buffer uh, the memory buffers to disk uh, at a high pace, and therefore we didn't see any significant performance advantage. Also, the the the, the reason for this is I, I'm I'm saying it again to emphasize the the the, the topology. We used a fasting hub that, uh, with a lot of instances. When we ran, uh, uh, ran just one instance uh, from the primary through the fasting and to standby, the behavior was was very good. But when, when we we had the 16 instances at once, the behavior the the, the behavior was not as we expected. So in this situation the no film uh, we didn't any see any benefit. Let's talk about the CPU consumption. Uh, as as uh, in the MAA uh, documentation uh, of uh, Oracle Group MAA group uh, high availability, uh, they recommended to use a, a CPU uh, a count uh, even one. So uh, this this is the this feature is called instance caging. We have a lot of uh, CPUs. Each instance uh, doesn't need more than one CPU for this reboot transfer. Most of the the, the, the work is uh, is memory and uh, and the I/O. So uh, we use it. We change it to a uh, to a higher value, and again the behavior was the same. In this uh, uh, topology, again, uh, there were a lot of uh, the, uh, ASM instances uh, and uh, some uh, uh, of uh, fasting instances, and also in the primary, we saw that the TKTM process, the virtual key pair time of processes, uh, the process that uh, should uh, 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 publishing a wall clock uh, and uh, in, in charge of measurements, it took a lot of CPU. And uh, there, there are some bugs in it. There are some patches that needed to to, uh, to eliminate this uh, option. We saw when we eliminated it, uh, we saw improvement, significant improvement. But uh, this is what just from the benchmark side. We are not recommending you uh, changing this underscore uh, parameters. Yeah, one uh, the, one of the reason you know the, is that you you have one of those uh, uh, virtual keeper of time process per instance, and also one process per database per per ASM instance, which means that you know if we if we um, if we're running sixteen instances or ten instances, you know, for with ten instances, you would have eleven such processes, each one consuming you know a few percentages of the of the CPU. That immediately gets you into tens of percentage of the CPU being used for uh, for this virtual keeper of time process, and therefore you know that that's something that uh, you know you need to take care of it. And, and Oracle uh, definitely noticed it too, and uh, and they're reducing that. Uh, you know they, they fix that bug. You know the the other potential uh, CPU hog is uh, is compression, as we mentioned earlier. So you know you, you need to uh, balance here your needs between uh, dealing with the with the network network traffic and uh, how much how many CPU cycles free CPU cycles you have uh, and and decide whether you want to use compression or not. Moving to the next slide, we we'll speak about the uh, fasting I/O pattern. Uh, this is something that we learned uh, by uh, a lot of uh, tests and benchmarks and. Uh, uh, we will speak uh, later about uh, how it is hard to do it on a fasting uh, machine because there is no AWR in the fasting machine. So we did a lot of IOSTAT. Uh, we we saw that the uh, the, the, the log buffer is not almost not. Uh, we we see we didn't see any advantage of the log buffer uh, or usage of this. Each block that uh, we got for the, the fasting is getting from the primary. Immediately is, is written to the standby read logs, uh, and the other process, uh, another separated process, is uh, taking uh, this block from the 
understand a little of files and then move it to the uh, uh, remote uh, side for the, to the standby. And, and simultaneously, again, when the uh, uh, read log file uh, uh, is full, uh, the, there is a, a read log file. Uh, it is copied from the standby read log file to the uh, uh, to uh, archive log file. So we so we see it, as you see it in the in the picture here. We see a lot of I/O. Uh, once is written to the, uh, the read log file and then read it again, even if it's in, in the memory, uh, it is sending to the standby, and each read and write of, for the archive logging uh, uh, files. Yeah, that, um, you know, that, that, that means that, you know, if, you're, uh, if your system is, is getting, uh, say, you know, 500 megabytes of, uh, of data from redo logs, you need I/O capabilities in your parsing node uh, to do four times as much. You know, twice from a write perspective and twice from a read perspective. If we relate to the read log files, yes, because you know, in in the primary there is a lot of data files. There is a, a undo a, a table space, temporary table space. This will not be in the parsing. But if we are just relating to the read log files. It's uh, four times. Yeah. What, um, in this picture, um, you know, we, we, as we related earlier, we said that um, in, in the parsing node, uh, much, most of the memory is actually left unused. So one of the ideas that we want to experiment with, and this is a future for us, is to leverage some of that memory as a cache for the standby redo log. Uh, for example, you know, if we use ZFS, the file system, uh, we believe, uh, we still need to prove it, uh, that uh, the, the file system cache can benefit and therefore the, the, the reads, the number two and number three IOs in this picture will happen from memory and not from the disk. So that could be, give us uh, a significant advantage this is something that we have yet to, uh, to test in our environment. Another important thing, uh, because of this I.O., uh, and also uh, we, we use just one member uh, for the standby redo logs file. There is no need for more than one file uh, for this uh, standard redo log files because we, we will always have the uh, regular redo. So uh, this is also uh, one of the recommendations about and it will reduce just a little bit the I.O. Moving to the next slide, we will speak about uh, other, some other observation and setup that we, we used. As Ellen said before, we spoke about the alternate line. When the, when the, uh, the far sink that is co-located usually or near the primary is not uh, active, usually we are using alternate in a production system. In our benchmark system, we didn't use the alternate mm -hmm. because we want to see all the uh, traffic uh, going to the far thing, and if there is a problem, we don't. Uh, we want to see what is happening. And usually, in a, a, a production environment, we recommend an Oracle also uh, that the, there is will be a, another far sync instance that will be close to the standby. If you want to switch over, and again to be sync from the primary to the far thing, so you need an, another far thing. In our test environment, we didn't use this uh, 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 extra far thing. If we, we would, if we would uh, switch over, we would uh, write directly to the primary in async. And also, when uh, you are using to, to write from the primary to the far thing, usually uh, you, uh, you are you should configure uh, the max failures, uh, so, so the primary will uh, will leave the far sync and go over to the alternate. But we change the parameters here to max failures to zero. It will be infinitely twice in our benchmark. Uh, our setup was a uh, maximum availability with the default net timeout parameter of uh, 30 seconds. And uh, and again, as I said, no multiplex we used for also for on to the online redo log files 
of the primary parsing and standby, and also to the standby redo logs files, just to make the uh, environment uh, plain and easy to calculate all the the IO pattern that we talked about uh, before. And the uh, important thing is to use the Armen uh, deletion policy. Uh, there is an in Armen option to uh, to define to delete uh, all applied uh, archives, uh, all applied on the old standby. So, so the when we did the, the benchmark again and again, and the, the archive space was uh, filled, and this automated uh, feature helped us uh, not to handle this uh, area. Moving to the next slide, and add some other uh, observation, uh, because we, we have primary uh, fasting and standby, it is mostly recommended to use Data Guard Broker. Data Guard Broker is a main place to define everything in, I think, uh, four or five commands you can finish uh, and define the setup. Uh, if you are, will not use the Data, uh, data Guard Broker, you will have to do a lot of commands and verifications. Even uh, when you doing, want to uh, switch over or fail over, the broker helps a, a lot. As I said before, no, no farsing uh, and no AWR in the farsing. No option. We didn't have any option, so we used a system uh, utilities like like IOSTAT. Uh, we monitor the network uh, just to see the behavior. We saw by uh, by the time that we are doing it uh, more than than a year, I think uh, that we had a lot of problems in the fasting. The behavior of the alternate didn't work. And uh, when the fasting is uh, shutting down and raising it again, uh, it is not uh, getting back to the system. So the, uh, you, you should use the latest patches. Uh, the, the, regular, the, the, the first installation of 12.1, we didn't say, we can see it here. We used 12.1 from this uh, benchmark. And uh, we are going to uh, to check it again in 12.2. Uh, we have uh, a feeling that some of the, these problems will be better, and uh, we'll not see them in 12.2. When when we are when we are uh, uh, when we did it, uh, we saw a lot of uh, uh, space uh, uh, stress from the primary, and we and some of the read log files, uh, the archive log files were deleted. Uh, so we, we missed the, the, uh, the standard was out of sync. Uh, and one of the good features from 12 is that you can use a one command to recover from service and that's all. Uh, your uh, standby is uh, rebuilt immediately. Okay, so um, you know, I think uh, you can get uh, the the you know the, the impression that you know from uh, from Yossi, you know, he's been working uh, very hard in the last year and a half, uh, the, you know, trying to understand how to get the maximum out of farsing. It, it is a great technology. I think you know uh, we we strongly believe that you know that it really uh, provides a lot of potential. Uh, in disaster recover environments, um, but you know there's still uh, there, there's there needs to be a, a lot of tuning and deep understanding in order to get uh, the maximum out, out of that technology. Uh, let's move to the next slide. And here, you know, um, as I said earlier, farsing is uh, we see farsing as an enabler, an enabler to get you to uh, zero data loss. Uh, having said that, you know, it still leaves this um, uh, dilemma as to, you know, what distance do you put your farsing node from the primary? Obviously, you know, if I, uh, if I take uh, a very short distance, you know, if I, even if I collocate my farsing uh, node with my primary, uh, I get the, the best performance because the, the, the latency, the, the synchronous latency is reduced basically to zero. There's no, there's no distance. 
On the other hand, I increase the, the risk of data loss because of a loss, uh, local disaster recovery. A disaster. Local disaster would take both the primary system and the farsing system uh, and, you know, and therefore you would risk uh, losing some data. So at the, end of, uh, at, the, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, you could put your farsing node far away from your primary node but that means increased latency. That means that you need to put some costly lines between your uh, primary system and your farsing node. Uh, that you would need an additional data center uh, to host your farsing node. And last but not least, you you uh, you know as as you start increasing the distance between the primary and the farsing node, the uh, the risk of a link failure between the two nodes will increase. And if you lose that node, that that uh, that link, you will you increase the, the the risk of losing data. And that's that's where Axana can actually come to play. So, um, what is Axana? Axana, think of Axana as a ruggedized uh, node where you, the customer, can run your uh, farsing instance in a virtual machine. But this virtual machine is going to pro be protected by many, many layers. Some are logical, you know, we have this, what we call the Phoenix operating system that has all the smarts around the disaster recovery. It will know how to, um, uh, to, to switch to battery. It will, uh, if you lose connectivity, it will know how to uh, move transparently to a cellular uh, to a cellular network etc cetera, etc cetera. so all the smarts are in the phoenix operating system the 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 axana solution acts as a data safe uh, your data is 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 safe within axana uh, safe from a physical um, uh, you know uh, fire or or other uh, uh, physical issues that might happen uh, the Axana uh, solution is battery powered, so if you lose power, it will still be there. Will, you will still be able to transfer whatever data is in the farsing node to your standby node. And like I said earlier, we can leverage any kind of network, whether your WAN, LAN, whatever, the fastest network that will be available, all the way to a cellular network using 4G technology. And last but not least, uh, you'll see that uh, the, the, uh, the, the farsing within Axana has all the physical protection needed. Um, so in a solution, when you, you combine the two together, you, you will collocate your primary node with the Axana uh, black box uh, that is running your farsing node. During normal operation, uh, we will use 10 gigabit or your WAN, uh, or, you know, 10, 10 gigabit uh, connectivity to transfer data from the farsing node to the remote standby. And uh, as you can see here, uh, there is zero distance between your primary and the Axana protect protected farsing. So from a latency perspective, you get uh, the best possible solution, you know, because, you know, it cannot get any better than zero distance. On the other hand, if you lose your primary, we guarantee that the Axana uh, black box is going to survive. It will try to communicate through whatever means, which includes, you know, uh, in uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet if available, or 1 gigabit Ethernet, or uh, the cellular, uh, cellular capability. The Axana box has two cellular modems that enable it, enable it to transfer the data to the remote standby. So what is Axana all about? Um, you know, here's a, a long list of the, of the protection that we will get with Axana. It's a very resilient flash-based storage and server in a black box. Uh, it runs a full-fledged Linux system within it that allows you to run the farsing node within the Axana black box. And it has all these wonderful ca uh, capabilities of, you know, sustaining direct fire, heat, etc., etc. 
But I think that a short video here uh, will be will do a much better uh, job than me explaining that. So, uh, Melanie, if you can show. All right, I think I'm back. So, just to summarize, uh, you know, we be believe that uh, Oracle, uh, Oracle FarSync and Axana are really a winning combination that really enables you to get uh, to the promise of, uh, of FarSync of zero data loss at any distance. And you get that also without any compromise from latency and, and performance perspective because, again, your primary node and your FarSync node will be co-located. That also gives you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, true protection against link failure because the, 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 the two systems, the primary and the FarSync, uh, are in the same data center, so there, uh, there's no going outside, you know, there's no dependency on an external link. And what you get at the end of the day with zero data loss is this guarantee that all of your applications will be consistent up to the last committed transaction. And again, you know, I'd like to end with a short video just to tell you that it's, this is not only Exana saying this, but it's, it's, you can also hear from uh, Larry Carpenter, who's the master product manager of, um, uh, of the, uh, the Data Guard solution. So let's move to any any questions. We reach the end of our presentation. Yes, we had a few questions come through. But first, um, if you were unable to watch the video, we will include a link to watch it post broadcast along with the recording and the slide deck. So if you were unable to see those videos, double check the IOUG Resource Center later today, and you can check those out. The first question we had come through. Did you test FarSync on Oracle version 12.2? Yes, when we started to, uh, to check uh, 12.2, we see that uh, all the features are uh, working uh, almost the same. Uh, there is a change in the, some of the views that uh, we can see the, uh, the progress of the database, of the data guard. Uh, and the alternate feature is switched for a good way. There is a priority. A primary can send uh, some uh, uh, redo to not to uh, all, not by alternate uh, feature. There is a priority between the uh, the standby or parsing uh, sites. And we, we are keeping uh, ch uh, checking it right uh, these days. Okay, uh, I'll take the the second question here. Can FarSync be installed on a virtual machine? Uh, the, the short answer is definitely yes. Uh, and here I go back to what I mentioned earlier in the presentation. FarSync uh, is relatively modest in its uh, resource requirements from a CPU perspective, memory perspective, and uh, etc. Uh, you know, you, you, it, it doesn't require a lot of resources. Uh, and actually, what we do in Axana, within the black box, we create a virtual machine environment where the customer can install the machine, the FarSync with his own um, uh, operating system, his own uh, environment that uh, is required by, the, by its enterprise, and running it, running it within a, a virtual machine. Um, and the results uh, are definitely, you know, we don't see any significant penalty from running in a virtual machine versus a physical box. Again, again concerning, there is a question, uh, using DataGuard Boker is a must uh, for FastSync environment. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the slide, uh, it is not a must. I recommend using it, otherwise you have to uh, uh, type a lot of commands, but you don't, you is not a must. And then uh, the fourth question is, are there any license issues using FarSync? Uh, Lucy, you want to 
Uh, first thing, uh, as uh, Oracle is mentioning, it's free. You don't have to uh, to uh, to pay for the on the host that you are installing it uh, by CPU. You don't need to. Uh, it doesn't matter how many instances you are using, but that uh, uh, first thing it can be used only for Active Data Guard. So if you have Active Data Guard license, then uh, you can use the first thing. Okay. Uh another uh, question here uh, again related to virtual machines can you create multiple virtual machines in Axana and fail over to another version uh, the short answer is that currently no the currently uh, the Axana product creates a single virtual machine where you run your farsync uh, uh, node um, you know, potentially in the future, you know, uh, you know there's nothing that uh, that would prevent uh, a, a, in some future release of the product to, to run multiple virtual machines, uh, but the current implementation uses a single virtual machine. We have a question here about uh, uh, do we have a, a, a risk using a parsing in, in, instead of a standard data guard? Uh, first thing, uh, I think it's it's less than a risk the, the, the other way. Uh, if the first thing will not work, you can you are still can use the alternate option and it is as the same it was before. Uh, our benchmark we, we saw we didn't speak it uh, spoke about it in the in the lecture that uh, when the the primary if it needs to work synchronous against passing. It, it can work faster because the acknowledge is faster from an instance that uh, doesn't need to uh, to handle uh, database files or uh, undo uh, data or anything or checkpoints. So the response from uh, the first thing is, very, is faster. So if you are, we are talking about synchronous uh, replication, uh, first thing is better than uh, not using first thing. The next question uh, is how does Farsync uh, stack up against max availability? Um, and um, you know, in, in, I would say that in general, you know, Farsync uh, max availability uh, suffer, suffers from the uh, the latency of the network. So you know, in max availability, you uh, you have to put your standby. Uh, at a reasonable distance, uh, but still, you know, whatever the distance, either, even if it's a, a few tens of kilometers, you will already see an impact of several uh, milliseconds in latency. The, 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 the main advantage of Farsync is that uh, you, by, uh, and if you use Axana, that by collocating Farsync with, uh, with your primary, you don't suffer that latency issue that you would suffer with uh, max availability. Um, the next question, uh, what's the expected latency towards the sync far sync instance? Uh, this, uh, again, um, similar to the, to the prior question, you know, uh, in, in the general case, uh, you, if you do not collocate far sync with your primary, then uh, you will start uh, experiencing the, the latency of the of the network, so it really depends on the distance that you place your farsync instance from the primary. Uh, that's you know the, since the, the communication between the primary and the farsync is synchronous, uh, that means that you you have to wait for the whole round trip. Again, uh, again, if you use if you leverage technology like uh, like uh, Axana which enables you to collocate the farsync node with the primary, then uh, you, you minimize the, the latency issues uh, of the network basically to zero. The next question is, uh, uh, does Axana support a remote Z Z ZL array? Uh, we are currently, we are just, uh, uh, we are using our system as a host, regular host that uh, a, a virtual host that you can install a farsing instance. So uh, all of our topology is uh, farsing, it's data guard, 
We are, currently, we are not in this uh, area of uh, ZLA. Uh, with that, um, you know, uh, Yossi and I would like to thank uh, all the participants. Uh, great questions. Uh, and we definitely look forward to continuing uh, this conversation uh, offline. Um, you know, you have our email addresses. Feel free to contact us uh, for any additional questions. You know, we're uh, eager to uh, to, to get uh, the, the conversation going. Wonderful. Thank you, Alan and Yossi, for sharing your insights and expertise. We greatly appreciate it. And that concludes today's webcast. Before we conclude, please make note of our upcoming webinars and past webinars by visiting www.iog.org. A recording from today's webinar, along with the slide deck and the videos, will be available in the IOUG Resource Center. There is a survey after this webcast for you to complete. We thank you in advance for your feedback. Again, we appreciate you attending today's webcast, and have a great day.